Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. We had a few uh, technical difficulties uh, getting started. I'm Mike Lau. This is Varun Sakalkar. And we're here to talk about the data centers of the future. We work together on bringing together the AI technologies together with the data centers. So let's quick, uh, do a quick deep dive into what we're seeing as the shifts in technology. And there's a lot of co-design, as we've heard as some of the themes, of how do we build AI and ML systems together with our data center infrastructures? And how do we unlock uh, new technologies and new opportunities for AI? And, uh, and this is really foundational for what we're going to see in the upcoming years. Uh, what we've seen in the past is we have to look beyond the machine and the rack. Uh, for much of the time, we do a lot of compute, storage, networking. That's been a lot of the traditional work that we've been seeing, where we can do a lot of configurations that go into many different places all around the world. These can be going into Google data centers. They could be going into colos. And all these configurations are relatively small. And when a machine fails, it doesn't really affect the entire system. It doesn't interrupt the entire system. But as we get to a scalable AI and ML future, what we're starting to see is many different accelerators working together with the servers and storage, uh, TPUs, GPUs, the networking that's going together with it. And it's turning into these highly interconnected and cohesive system design. So in order to make this scale, how do we make some of these interfaces much more fungible? How do we make one design that can go everywhere? Because we're not just building one supercomputer. We're building a lot of super supercomputers all around the world. And as we take a look at availability, that's super important. So we started in uh, 2016. If you heard from Google, we, did, we uh, contributed the 48 volt, the point of load technology. And that makes it so that the machines, they're good for, like the, the power systems are good for the life of the machine. And there's no power supply swaps or anything like that. That builds up to the enclosure levels where you see uh, the open rack V3, open rack V2, where you have redundant power conversion and battery backup. And naturally, that rolls up to the row level, where you have different uh, levels of redundancy, where you can have uh, unplanned and planned service events. Very good to keep your networks running and all these ML systems. And this ties all the way up into the facilities. And these have to work all in conjunction together. And that's how you get to these holistic delivery of efficient, high availability platforms for Google and cloud. But what's happening with high power? We're seeing a lot of high power as one of the main things that we talk about. So high power chips, this is an increase in the power of the chips themselves, but it's also the heat flux density on a relatively small chip. The power keeps going up, but the chip is not actually growing that quickly physically. When you put multiple of these onto a board, we actually have to figure out a way to power them. Uh, so high power density trays becomes very challenging. We have 48 volt vertical power delivery. That takes 48 volt power, brings it directly under the chip, into the chip, and then you have to get the energy out. And this is where a lot of the liquid cooling happens. And that's supported by all the rack infrastructure that goes around it. So there's power, there's VBUs, there's power distribution within the rack, liquid cooling. And the other part is, how do we uh, make sure this is manageable? How are we making sure it stays healthy? So we want to keep that habitat healthy. So that's a big part of it that doesn't get talked about a lot. And this has to happen at hyperscale everywhere around the world. If we take a quick look at uh, 48 volt power systems, uh, servers and storage has been a staple and will continue be a, to be a staple of our data center systems. And uh, from a hard drive standpoint, relatively low power. You mix in some servers, they're going to be higher power. But what happens when ML systems enter this field? Like, what gets added to this ecosystem? Well, one thing that can happen is if we continue using the same parts, you're going to run into some challenges. You're going to have physical size challenges. You have distribution losses. And how do you actually deploy these? Because if you've seen a lot of the photos of very large ML systems, there's a lot of cabling. There's a lot of hands-on work. But if a lot of it gets used by the same power conversion pieces and also the battery backup, it doesn't leave a lot of space for the topologies that we want to build. So what's next? So as part of the next generation power, we're going to look into uh, plus or minus uh, 400 volt DC rack power. And this will really unlock some new potential for these ML systems. And how do you grow beyond this when racks are becoming hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, kilowatts each? And we get to the point where how do we actually change the way we think about designing for this ML mindset? You want really resilient, very secure systems. You want them to be interconnected, highly available from power, but actually deployable everywhere very, very quickly. And that efficiency becomes more and more important. And serviceability becomes a big part. As you saw in some of our earlier talks, there's robotics, but there's also the people that have to go do it. So how do you turn things that are workloads that are uh, theory and mathematical into something that's very physical? It turns into rows, and then it turns into data centers. And now uh, Varun is going to talk about how the data center is actually becoming that machine. 
thank you, Mike. Uh, so, uh, you know, AI is being called uh, societal infrastructure. Uh, and true to its name, it is challenging all a lot of constraints that we have taken for granted uh, historically. Uh, Mike very nicely talked about some of the IT trends. I'll come back to it. But I want to talk about some other trends. Uh, and it is the core design across all these constraints together that we need to consider to bring something and make it real, uh, bring something to the market. Uh, one of those is uh, how do we manage the life cycle and emergent business trends for data centers? For example, you want uh, a, a training to be co-located in a very large campus, uh, multiple gigawatts sometimes, and then inference to be spread all over the world. How do we do that? Uh, how do we manage the disparate uh, um, requirements from workloads? Uh, 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 sometimes uh, training can live with a little bit less uptime, uh, but uh, something uh, an enterprise user might require extremely high reliability. So they are very bimodal kind of distributions when it comes to requirements. Then we have energy trends. Uh, world is running out of power. Um, and uh, data centers are extremely power hungry, uh, especially AI, AI workloads. So how do we manage uh, the lack of energy where we want it as we look forward? And, when, and we do that while being cognizant of our environment. Net zero is a very big commitment for Google. Uh, we have committed to being uh, net zero by 2030. Uh, and, and so we cannot leave that aside when looking about, uh, when thinking about these uh, infrastructure elements. And then finally, IT trends. Uh, I'll talk about that in, in a bit. Um, I, will, I want to take each of these trends one by one and just, uh, this is not a holistic list, but just some uh, food for thought on how, I am, how Google is thinking about it. So when we talk about business trends, the key is uh, on the left-hand side, you see a host of new requirements. Our goal is to accommodate all of them uh, with, the, with the most uh, sparse com uh, you know, compatibility matrix as possible, which means that you want a lot of fungibility. And the, the, most, the design principle that we are following is uh, interface convergence. Define your interfaces across the stack, co-design them, and then keep them constant. That's the only way to deliver these technologies at very fast pace, across, at scale, globally. Um, switching gears, um, I talked a little bit about energy trends. Uh, so there are two uh, specific things to talk about. In steady state, um, I talked about net zero. The graph on the left talks about if you do nothing, uh, uh, we are in trouble. Uh, you, you are uh, multiple orders of magnitude um, away from where we want to be. So doing nothing is not an option. Uh, one key thing that we, are, uh, we, we think uh, that helps us get uh, on, back, uh, on track is taking energy efficiency very seriously and understanding the load characteristics very, uh, very seriously. So understand what flexibilities exist on a, on a, on, in your load on the workload side and take advantage of it to deliver, run workloads only when you have green power available, green energy available, and take, take advantage of that. So that's the steady state behavior that we want. And then there's a responsive behavior. I also talked about world is running out of power. This is uh, the graph on, the, on the, the picture on the, uh, the right talks about, uh, for US, where do we see emergent constraints coming up on the grid? You can see a lot of yellow and red, very few greens, which means almost all of this country is going to be in, in an energy crisis soon if we don't do something. So again, we need to think about how do we kind of solve for this constraint today, otherwise we will be um, short of a uh, pretty critical uh, uh, amount of energy very, very soon. One approach uh, we are considering is looking at on-site power. Uh, Google had an announcement around Kairos uh, yesterday, uh, nuclear energy, uh, 500 megawatts of it, uh, through SMRs. But if you generalize it, there are th it's a trilemma. I call it an energy trilemma. Uh, we want to look for sources of energy which are reliable, because as I mentioned earlier, Although there are certain workloads that, that can have, live with low uptime, but Google, has, Google Cloud also serves enterprise users. So you want reliability uh, uh, considered pretty, uh, pretty highly. Uh, you want it to be clean, and then you want it to be low cost. So you want to solve for all these three uh, problems in a way that gets you the right source of energy in the location you want. And finally, I want to come back to the IT trends. Uh, Mike talked about 48 volts. Uh, uh, 
you know, we, we, we have also talked about 400 volt DC uh, as some uh, a new interface that we are uh, kind of leaning pretty heavily into. I think there's a talk as to, uh, tomorrow on this topic. The picture on the right here, uh, uh, on, the, on the left here, is um, kind of our legacy architecture, as I call it. Uh, legacy from, uh, from Google's perspective, because Google has been doing liquid cooling, uh, CDU-based liquid cooling for a while. The picture in the middle is what we think the data center of the futures uh, look like. We, you still have a grid component, but that grid has uh, some energy storage uh, element uh, deeply integrated in, into it. It also has on-site alternative sources of energy. Uh, it can be nuclear, it can be fuel cells, it needs to be clean, to my, uh, to my point earlier. When we think about cooling, uh, liquid cooling, is, the paradigm of liquid cooling is, is here to stay. But how do we deliver liquid cooling? Is CDU still the right place for it to be co-located in the server hall? That's something that we should think about. Uh, when we think about energy storage, uh, batteries are going to be a big component, as we say it. So how do we integrate? Uh, currently, batteries are spread all over the place. Sometimes you have UPS, sometimes you have Windrack batteries. How can we take advantage of a more centralized source of uh, storage at the, at the uh, building level, at the data center level, or at the campus level, and use that so storage for uh, understand, uh, taking advantage of um, uh, you know, time of use um, to, to reduce your uh, um, carbon footprint? And finally, uh, we, we want, I want to kind of plug uh, again um, the soft components of a data center is sometimes often uh, underlooked, uh, overlooked. Uh, so controls uh, combined with the energy storage is, is an extremely important component. Microgrids uh, as, a, as a way to kind of bridge disparate sources of uh, energy along with storage uh, and so that you, ha you can dispatch energy where you need it and uh, when you need it is going to be extremely important. Um, I want to kind of leave you with this parting thought. Um, I think this, uh, another uh, keynote speaker made this point very eloquently. Uh, Co-design is, uh, is, is the answer to actually deliver the data center of the future so that all these systems that we talked about actually work efficiently and, uh, and we have a path to a high performance and a sustainable uh, AI data center in the future. Thank you.